Thank you for coming, everyone. I'm Evan. I designed this programming language, Elm, and I've been working on it over 10 years now. And I wanted to share what I learned that I, I, wanted, I would want to have heard when I started out as a student. Um, so when, when I was at university, I was finishing up my undergraduate, and I was doing my thesis, and I was reading all these papers, and I thought they were so cool. And I had this feeling that there was this you know, somewhere out there, there's this big hallway of beautiful ideas, and you don't, you don't get to just see them. You have to s stand in front of it and be patient and be diligent, and if you wait long enough and you read the right things and you look at it from the right angle, this fog lifts and you get to see the beautiful thing in there. And it was always in there, but now you get to see it. And you can show it, hey, check it out. The fog's not there, you can see it. And that's not to say that, like, it's something that's properly transcendently good. It's just like to me at that moment, I was like, ah, I, got, I figured it out. I found out what was behind the fog. And so for me, working on a program language was always this kind of intrinsic motivation of I, I want to be able to find out about these things. Um, and as I worked on it, I, I was very lucky to, to have people support my work. And through that, I would meet other language designers, compiler writers, virtual machine people. And I'd hear things like, um, there's nine engineers working on Rust. I'm like, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. You know, it's a bigger language and it's got this cool compiler and 10 engineers on Swift. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and at some point I heard there are 30 engineers on Dart and I was just like, I was just like that's, that's fine, but I don't, I just can't account for how, what would happen with that many people. Um, because from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm fresh out of college and I'm like, the job is you do some engineering, right? You write a compiler and you make some packages. But as time went on, it's like, okay, well, but you need to have the infrastructure for your, for your website for the packages and you need to make sure the releases work on all the different uh, operating systems and different chips. And then there's like this other stuff where it's like, you should be on Twitter and you should write blogs and do talks and you should be participating on GitHub and in the forums. Um, and then a bit later, it's like, okay, well, there's also like people running conferences and doing Elm Bridge and like, should you be providing some structure to make sure that's happening in a good way? And so maybe you should get some trademarks so that if someone's gonna run that kind of thing, you can make sure they have a code of conduct and there's certain guidelines. And if you're gonna do that, probably you need a foundation that's gonna have some accounting and you're gonna have to do taxes for that. And, you know, my attitude throughout all this was like, yeah, I, I can do it, I can learn new things. Um, <laughs> And at some point, I kind of realized, like, okay, I can do, I can do these things. <laughs> and I can do those things, okay, but I'm just, like, I, I, I'm getting crushed by all this work. So I took a step back, and I was like, you know, maybe, you, maybe more than one person's, like, a good idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know about 30, but, like, two or three. Um, and so I was like, who pays for these jobs? And why are they doing that? And why, why aren't they doing that to me? <laughs> um, so I thought about it a lot, and I kind of came up with these two overall categories of how languages are funded. Um, and so in corporate languages, there's a couple options. Independent languages, there, there's a couple as well. Um, and with each option that's available, there's certain design incentives, um, and there's certain career risks that come along with it. Um, sorry, my wife is texting me. Probably good luck. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so before we get into all the different options and all the different trade-offs, I want to take a step back and talk about traffic acquisition costs. Is anybody familiar with traffic acquisition costs? Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, this is when Google pays to be default search in Safari and in Firefox. Um, and this is probably the largest flow of money into programming languages happening right now. Um, so we're gonna figure out how does this work and sort of then come back to the landscape for programming languages. So I went and read all of Google's uh, SEC filings for the last 20 years, and we don't, we don't have to read them. I made it a diagram. Um, so 2022, $283 billion is flowing into Google. Um, and if, if we split that between every person who's in America, that'd be $880 for everybody. So everyone, you all get 880. Everyone you ever know, everyone they ever knew, it, it's kind of a lot, I don't know. And 
that's going all these different places. And the one we care about is traffic acquisition costs, $49 billion. And what happens here is a big chunk of that is going to Apple. It's hard to get exact numbers because no one lists it exactly on their SEC filings. Um, but there's this firm uh, that everyone references when the, you ask this question, and they estimate that uh, in 2021 it was $15 billion, and in 2022 it was between 18 and 20. So let's just say it's 15. I, I don't know exactly. Um, and you know they go into their code, and in seven places they say Google.com instead of Bing.com, and then they're like, "Thank you, thank you." <laughs> um, and then Fire, uh, Mozilla Corporation also. Um, so there's Mozilla Foundation, but Mozilla Corporation is where most people are employed, and the money flows through. Um, you can go read their yearly reports, and it's around 400 million that's going into Firefox for Bing default search. And so when I found this out, my first question was like, why, why is it so much money? It's like, do you just go to the website? I don't get it. Um, and then second, why is it so much for the traffic acquisition costs? It's an incredible amount. So for why so much revenue, I, I, may, I got a list of the top companies in the world by revenue. And I, we're, we're interested in number 18, Google. Um, but I noticed some weird things about uh, this list. I, I was like, oil and gas, and then Commodities is like people who sell oil and gas. It's like oil and gas, commodities, oil and gas, oil and gas, commodities, oil and gas, commodity, oil and gas, oil and gas, oil and gas. And I was like, man, I wonder if those people are powerful and influential. Um, <laughs> and the, the other thing I noticed is that like right below Google is Toyota. So like all the Toyota cars that were produced in the whole world in 2022, we collectively spent less money than we did on whatever it is that Google does. <laughs> and so um, I, I have this personal theory, I don't know if it's true, but I was like, okay, what if they're like a landlord instead of an advertiser? So in a traditional landlord, you have all these locations, and if you're in the shopping area, maybe you get some kind of rent, and if you're in the residential area, and it's like a wealthy residential area, but maybe you're in the like, you know, it's Copenhagen, so it's like less wealthy, residential area, um, and part of what influences what rent you can get at all these locations is the transportation, right? So if you're near a subway station, that's probably a better spot than if you're just out in like this spot over here, where there, there is a really nice swimming pool, but you, you gotta take the bus. Um, and so when I think of an internet landlord, the transportation is different. It's the search box, right? You don't go on the bus and you're not in a specific location, you just get in the search bar and you go to the place. And the place isn't like the website you go to, the locations are Shoes Street. Um, and you see all the storefronts on Shoes Street that you can go to. And it's tours of Rome Street. And you can see, oh, here's all the shops that I can go to. And when I made these searches a few days ago, I noticed that every single link that is visible to me is a sponsored link. Um, on both of them. And so I think of it as like, okay, these people are like paying their rent to be right outside the train station, right in that first spot where they're gonna get the most foot traffic. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you haven't thought about what your opinions are on landlords, I can recommend this book, Progress and Poverty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's written by this guy who moved to San Francisco in 1860, and then he wrote the book in 1881, and he had this question, is like, I'm seeing this incredible uh, accumulation of wealth, but at the same time, I'm seeing this incredible poverty that is happening at the same time. Why is that happening? Um, and, you know, you don't have to listen to everything he says, but on landlords, he, he's very interesting. And so one idea that kind of comes out of that is like, what if you put a tax on rent only? Um, and he has a bunch of ideas and like, could you control, um, uh, regulate property prices without price controls through these other mechanisms. It's all very interesting. Um, and you know, he also, is, he's not a fan of landlords. But, um, but yeah, so why so much revenue? This is like my theory that I'm gonna go with for the purpose of this talk. It's my opinion, I don't know. Um, so why so much traffic acquisition costs? Well again, it's all about that search bar and the people who own that search bar um, have a certain amount of browser market share. So with Firefox, it's about 3%, and so Google's saying, okay, for $400 million, we would like that 3%, thank you very much. And with uh, 
Microsoft, not for sale, sorry, this is Bing territory, we get the rents off of this 5%. We wish it was more, but we get it. Um, and for Safari, they're almost uh, 20%. And so our estimate was that it was uh, $15 billion. And this is about to scale the difference between um, Firefox and, and Safari. And then Chrome, over 60%, they don't pay nothing. That's free real estate, baby. <laughs> and so you can you say, well, okay, there are costs. You have to make Chrome and you have to make Android. But we can look at this and say, well, Firefox, they're making it for $400 million. I wonder if having 60% of the real estate covers that. Um, <laughs> and so instead of wondering why is it so high, the better question is like, why is it so low, right? This, there's this incredible achievement um, with Chrome that's permitting these uh, amazing profits that they're seeing, or revenue that they're seeing, also profits. Um, so I went and looked at Microsoft's SEC filings as well, and they, I found an interesting thing, which is that when you look at their search and news advertising, it's $12 billion. So if they dedicated 100% of their revenue to being default search in, on Apple products, they can't afford it. It's like, okay, we're gonna turn off the servers, we're gonna fire everybody, we're just, only the money is going to you, and it's like, ah, are, are we gonna give up $3 billion to put Bing on all our phones? It's like, even if we wanted to, would we do it for $3 billion less? Um, so what are the practical consequences in terms of languages for this? Um, so we have all this crazy amounts of money and going into, um, and they're doing stuff with it. And so one of the things they buy is developer relations, um, DevRel. And so these are different kinds of jobs. So you have developer evangelists, you know, they're spreading the good word. And there's advocates fighting for justice. Uh, and <laughs> community managers building up our community stronger. Um, and so I, I, don't, I didn't know what these were, so I went and looked up and I found, okay, so evangelists do conferences and meetups, okay. Advocates support online channels, writing tutorials, guides, templates, collecting feedback for developers, which is crucial because you get the feedback but you don't get the interpersonal reaction, the interaction of uh, someone being like, you suck. <laughs> someone nice says, hey, people think you suck, and I say, okay. <laughs> I like, I, that's what I like to hear instead. Um, and then community managers make sure everything's running smoothly. And this is just one person's definition of these things, but you know, maybe this person's um, running Twitter, or if there's like a heated conversation, they help explain like why decisions were made and help it cool down. Um, and some of you may be thinking, man, this sure sounds a lot like marketing and support, but it's not that, it's not that. It's evangelism, it's advocacy, <laughs> it's community building. And by the way, programmers, we're not, susceptible to marketing. We can't be persuaded of anything. <laughs> and we don't need help. We'll just figure it out ourselves. Um, so, okay, so all that's happening, and we just, we don't talk about the money part. We're getting the benefits of all this DevRel. And then for some random person, you don't have all that money coming in, and what you get is the open source way. <laughs> so I found this um, through opensource.com, it linked to this, and it was very interesting, because it, it was telling me, the way is something like this. A person creates the first iteration and they have the special insight and they find the exact solution that no one else could find and then they give that away, right? And so other people start using it and from those users arise enthusiasts and they promote the software. I was like, oh, well, that's crazy, you get free DevRel. That's crazy because when Google does it, they pay for the DevRel though. <laughs> so why is it that when I do it, it's gonna be free? Um, and then step four, arising from the users, come people contributing to the software. And it's like, oh, that's incredible, free compiler engineers. It's like, that's quite a specialist education. And you know, now that I think of it, when Google does it, they, they pay those people to do those things. Why is it that I'm going to get those things for free? So maybe in step five, they'll explain how that part works. No, okay, okay. So, okay, so you take good care of your users. Right, okay, okay, I get it, I get it, okay. So uh, I'll read on. So, okay, step one, you attract users, right? So you do the marketing, you do. Um, and then you guide the participants and help them understand the goals of the project, you know. It sounds a little bit like onboarding if you were working with someone. Um, and then you grow the contributors and um, 
so you do the mentorship, right, and you do that for free. And also, you're doing the development, you're doing that for free, right? And so step four, right, like, because when, when Google does it, they pay for all those things. So, but when I do it, what's, when, where's the step where, where that happens? It's like, oh, okay, oh, no, there's, there's no step four. It's like a dance party, oh, right. It's like a dance party, and we want to have a dance party around the world. I, okay, I, okay, I get it now. And so what happens is that because we never talk about these huge flows of money and what they're getting us, we have the same expectations of what's going to happen in both these cases. So as a language designer, people are, are saying to you, why isn't, why isn't this happening in the blogs? Why isn't this happening over there? It's like, okay, well, I, I, I don't have $400 million. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, so how did we get to this place where there's this, the expectations match, but the situation is so different? Um, and so I think about it as like we have switching costs when you want to switch from one programming environment to another. That can be quite difficult. And then you have the added issue of Microsoft. And so historically what that meant is like people were making their online businesses on Internet Explorer. And they're like, this is cool. We're making money on the Internet. And then, well, there were these other browsers and they wanted to make money over there. But if they wanted to, there was this switching cost they had to pay. And what the people at Microsoft realized is that if we take advantage of this switching cost, well, we can make some money instead. And so the relationship between these organizations was out of whack. And so um, open source comes um, to resolve this conflict. So the term open source actually came from um, the company Netscape. They were having a lot of trouble with um, bugs and stuff. And so they said, okay, if we release all of our code, the hackers around the world, we're going to harness them. That was the word they used in their press release. We're going to harness them to improve our code, and that's going to save us from Microsoft. Um, and that was the birth of Mozilla, the mosaic killer. Um, and so the setup of this is that on one side, we have the platform developer who's making the browsers. On the other side, we have app developers who want to be in that marketplace. Like they say, okay, I'm going to pay rent for the storefront, and I'm going to be there. Um, and they're making websites, but maybe they're making mobile apps or desktop apps. It'd be the same for them. And so we have an agreement here. Though. And when the code is given away, we follow these certain rules. So it's like Google shouldn't be able to discriminate against field of endeavor. It's like why should they be able to say what people can do when they're participating in this marketplace or competing to be the landlord of the marketplace? Um, and there's all these rules that make a lot of sense. And what we get is this really incredible achievement where for um, what, what we do is those big companies do their traffic acquisition costs, and they do their anti-fragmentation agreements, and they do their mobile application distribution agreements, and you can go read about those. Um, and we, we don't talk about it. We don't think about it. It's not our problem. We just have no switching cost if the control of the platform changes hands. We can do our business over here. We can do our business over there. The flow of traffic, it comes to us. We pay rent to whoever's the landlord. It doesn't matter to us. Um, and I, I mean, I got to say, it's like that's definitely a really cool achievement that sort of in a collective way, we found this way to have these two things coexist. Um, should those things, traffic acquisition costs and all that exist? I don't, I don't That's a separate question. Um, so from here, the question is like, is this great achievement generalizable, right? So can this solve the switching class plus Microsoft problem for all cases? So in theory, we have some author, and it doesn't matter who, and they give away the code, and they do so following the open source way. And when Google does it, we say, yeah, it makes sense. If Microsoft gets the code, who cares? Like, they can go fight each other. It's no problem. Um, but when an individual does it, it doesn't work quite the same way because, one, you have the cost of developing the language, and two, you have the cost of developing a business. And for all the people who get the code, they just have the cost of developing the business. So there's this natural disadvantage of producing it when it comes to making money. Um, and the costs of developing the language are, are significant, right? So we have the design and implementation, the marketing, the onboarding, the mentoring, and you have to do the mentoring because that's how you get the free DevRel and the free compiler engineers. <laughs> and these are ongoing costs, you know? It's not like, oh, the language is over. Good, good work, everyone. Um, and, you know, the person you're giving all this away to is Amazon, and they say, okay, well, he's trying to do this kind of business. It's like, let's just put five people on it, and 
we'll have it instead and we'll have a bigger market and, and you just lose. Um, and the issue is it's not just Amazon, but it's like any organization that's larger than you. So if I'm an individual and I can work on the programming language 50% of my time and trying to do the business side 50% of my time, if someone wanted to do a better job than me, they just need one person to work like 60% of the time. <laughs> and so like this is a huge, um, a huge disadvantage in this particular case. So um, for me, the question that comes from this is there a, a way to address the switching costs problem um, that provides a clear pathway for small authors. It's not like, oh, we wanna like add, we wanna be Microsoft. It's just like, we wanna, we want people to feel comfortable that like if they don't like the thing, they switch to something else. But um, how do you solve this uh, asymmetry? So finally, we can return to all the different ways. Um, and so we'll start with corporate languages where traffic acquisition costs are a major factor. Um, so uh, Sile One is just a company specific platform. So this would be like Swift or C Sharp. You got all the money coming in because you're selling the phones, you've got the app store, you put Google in the search bar, you change the seven lines. And you're like, yeah, 10 people on Swift. Okay, sure. Um, and there's also the corporate alliance style. So this would be more like JavaScript where there's a technical committee TC39, where all these companies can come together and kind of negotiate how things should evolve to support the maximum uh, user base and create the biggest marketplace and have the most commerce flowing. And we just, we're just collecting rents. Who gets the market share? That's our business. Um, and so this would happen more in a contested platform kind of scenario. And the two parts is like for reducing traffic acquisition costs, like it's Google, they're producing Chrome and Android, which are um, really cool virtual machine work is happening there, and then increasing traffic acquisition costs. So you have Firefox and Safari, very cool virtual machine working happening there as well. But also Rust, because how I think about it is that um, the way Google kind of rose to its colossal market share is that they had the good performance and the stability, and a lot of the things that I heard about Rust was, we're gonna make uh, Firefox faster, we're gonna improve the stability and maybe we can use that same technique to move up our market share and move up our traffic acquisition costs. And you know, people will hear about Firefox and there'll be some brand uh, benefits. Um, and finally, rewarding talent. This is like the weird one of this group um, because only Google really does it. So one example is Dart. The person who made Dart, Lars Bach, um, was the technical lead for the V8 engine on Chrome. And so like the technical success of that, that it was faster and the pages were loading faster and the applications were working better, like Google essentially rode that to having a great reputation, being widely used, and just like all that free real estate that comes with that. And then also no one talks about it. It's just like, wow, they're so generous giving away this stuff for free because they love us. Um, and the other one is, uh, yeah, so, so the point there is like when, when Lars uh, says, hey, can I have 30 guys, it's like, yeah, I mean, is that all? <laughs> um, I, I'm sure it's, not, it's more complicated than that, but like, you know, you, you've earned something in terms of your reputation with, with the company when you do something like that. Go is an interesting one because the creator, before they did Go, did this language called Sawzall, which is about processing logs, and you might say, who cares about processing logs? Why do you get to make a programming language now? Um, so when someone goes to Shoe Street and they click on you know, the best, the, the, the top uh, location, well, that, that click gets written into the logs. So Google knows, okay, they're gonna be paying us a lot of money, but they, they don't actually know how much. And so they have to go process the logs to make the bills for everyone. So he essentially made the machine that counts the money. And so it's like, okay, you want three people. It's like, whatever, that's fine. And so one thing to note here is that of all the languages and projects we talked about, the only one that's like not obviously connected to traffic acquisition costs is C Sharp. It's like, it's flowing into all these projects, huge, huge, huge amounts of money. And then with independent languages, that's just not happening. This is a world where like all that money doesn't exist, but the expectations of what you should be producing and how quickly and what it should look like are all the same for some reason. Um, so in this one, there's a bunch. One of the most high profile is uh, patronage, which is kind of the style of Python. You know, Python is probably the most successful of like independent languages. Um, but OCaml is similar. Elm had that kind of thing. 
Um, and the great thing about this is that you're able to focus 100% on the language. There's someone else is doing the business. That's their business. And you know, the downside is that, well, it's their business. So if their things change for them, well, they change for you too. And so how well you're doing, what's going on with the language is kind of independent of what happens to you. Um, and so the next one, I think this is kind of the most productive uh, one, is consulting. So we have got Clojure, Elixir, Scala, Julia, and I'm sure there's others that do it as well. Um, and in this case, language usage probably correlates with number of clients. So like, as you have more work to handle, you also will be able to have more resources to handle that work. Um, you know, I, I haven't done this, but my, I imagine that you know, having cl more clients means having more work. And so it's not like, oh great, now that it's more successful, I get to work on the language more. It's like, okay, now I have all this other stuff to manage as well as doing the language as well. And so you have this contested resources situation. Next is research grants, Haskell, Camel, Scala. Um, this one's awesome because it's if, if your grants are flowing, you just do cool stuff. Um, the downside is that the language has to be a good research vehicle. Like the point is to explore things. Um, and if that's not what you want to do, then, well, well you have to do that. Um, and there's not going to be a DevRel budget. Like, DARPA doesn't care. Like, the conferences, the academic conferences don't care. It's just not going to happen. Um, this, we're starting to get into the weirder ones here. Editor licenses, Kotlin is the only example I know of this. Um, and again, language usage probably correlates with number of licenses, but the, the trouble is that you have to make a fancy editor. Like, and that's a really hard thing to do well. And so if someone was starting out as an individual, I'd say, you know, probably the editor needs to come first, otherwise it's gonna take too long. Because um, it turns out taking a language, making a language takes a long time. I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> so usage licenses, okay, these actually exist. Um, so Stata and Wolfram language for Mathematica are just straight up licensed. It's like, oh, you wanna use it? Pay me. And the reason for that is that they're, in, uh, they're used by academic institutions. So it's like, if you're an economist and you want to continue being an economist, your institution needs to give you access to Stata um, so that you can participate in how the research works there. And um, so for, for this one, let's imagine that it's not that model, which seems wouldn't make sense in a, like a commercial setting. And you say, okay, what if there existed a language that um, was free to use, but for commercial users, there was some license fee? Um, so in this one, it's cool because you can focus 100% on the language. When you do a good job on the language, like that's what people are paying you for. There's no extra part. There's no managing all these clients, and uh, that client's kind of annoying, but they pay good. And then, then. Um, but the issue is there's no established solution to the switching costs question. It's just like it totally makes sense that if someone doesn't like the thing anymore, it should be easy to switch off, and there should be a pathway for that. Um, but, but what would it look like in this one? I don't know. Um, next is hosting. Uh, I don't know a lot about Datomic, but that's kind of what I have in my mind as the example of this. And again, the good thing is that language usage probably correlates with number of clients for the hosting. Um, but the downside is the Jeff problem. So the issue is that um, it's Jeff Bezos. He's out there. He's looking for you. <laughs> so we've got this open source definition where Google, they give those stuff away to Microsoft, that works. And then we have this other thing where like, you have to do the development cost, you have to do the cost of business, and they do the cost of developing the business too. But they're Amazon. So they say, oh, you wanna do hosting? That's cool. Like, we'll just do it more and do it to more people and start to cannibalize their business. But, you know, I said to myself, well, there's one thing that Jeff can't do, and that's make a simple, easy to use interface <laughs> And so, no, no matter what, I have, uh, I have this competitive advantage that like, I can do that, and I can especially do it because I don't really have time to do a, a super advanced one. Um, but what I failed to see when I was first thinking about this was that it's not just Jeff. Like, I can get Jeffed by anybody. Um, so, A friend I know, he could Jeff me. A, a company down the street, I could get Jeffed by them. And it's no hard feelings. It's like, they want to do a hosting business. I was like, yeah, it's, it's no problem. But you would Jeff me? You would Jeff me? <laughs> so 
the final one is uh, donations. And I don't know of any examples of languages doing this. It might exist, but I, I don't know of it. Um, and theoretically, it would correlate with language usage. But the downside is that your career is very strongly related to public perception. So it may be the case that your language is used by like hundreds of thousands, millions of people. But if you're not present in the minds of those people, like that's going to affect you, right? Um, so now we have enough background to think about some of the design incentives here. So one of the decisions you have to make is, should I add this feature? Yes. And in the case you say yes, you're probably going to have less conflict. It's going to be more pleasant interactions. Um, and in the case of no, you're going to have less complexity, which is, that's good too. I mean, they're both kind of nice. Um, but in different environments, you're going to get different incentives to go one way or the other. So in the corporate alliance, maybe some company wants, wants this wild JavaScript feature. They say, it's not, I don't like accessing the field X. I want that to have side effects. Um, <laughs> So, but, and you say, okay, but why mess with the alliance? You know, like the point of this is we're trying to take over the world. We're trying to have the biggest marketplace in the world and the most commerce going through it. So they need that for their business. Um, and yeah, let's just add it. And if people don't like it, they cannot use it. They can put it in their style guides. They can put it in their linter. That we're, we don't care. Like what we want is the marketplace to be as big as possible. Um, so with a research vehicle, uh, maybe some researcher investigating independent types. It's very interesting. And here you ask, why mess with the research? Just like literally why? Like that's the whole point of everything we're doing. The point is to do research and find out how different features interact with each other. And it's just like, I can't even in my mind imagine a scenario where you'd want to say no, unless it like breaks everything. But like, I guess that's research too. Um, so here you have these yes incentives. And then with independent authors, say someone wants some new syntax or this or that. Okay, but here it's like, why mess with it kind of depends on what the author is trying to achieve, right? And they all have their idea of like, maybe some of them do want to have a high market share or explore certain ideas, or maybe they want this very specific developer experience, or maybe they want some combination of all those things. And so you might ask yourself, like, m why mess with simplicity, you know? Or why mess with the lambda calculus? I mean, why even have numbers, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> the, 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 it just depends on the author um, what, where you're going to go there. So here are the incentives aren't so clear, and it kind of depends on knowing what the language is trying to do. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to emphasize, I've never heard of anybody, of any designer or person who works on the language that has said, I had to make a choice. I don't think this is something where, like, bosses are telling people, you have to do this, you have to do that. But it's more that in a specific context, you kind of, like, I'll say in my example, like, there are features, language features that I like that I know Elm, it, Elm wouldn't like them. Like, it's, Elm doesn't want that. And in the same way, like when you're in these other environments, you can kind of tell, okay, what this language, what it needs is this. Um, and like what I want, I mean, that's separate. Like I'll work on my own programming language in my free time, which I know a lot of VM people do and stuff. Um, so, okay, on career risks, uh, I know the most about uh, patronage because I, I was very fortunate to have some people support my work. But here you have a job because it serves the purpose of a powerful person. And what I mean is, if someone can look at you and say, you, you don't have to worry about food or shelter, you can work on this thing. And they can just as easily say, actually not you, you, you can work on this thing over here. <laughs> it's like, that's power. Um, and so what, what are the purposes of that person? And what happens when their purposes change, right? Like if these people are running a business, maybe the business environment chains, changes. Or maybe they have a VC looking over their shoulder and they're saying, you know, that column over there with that open source guy? What are we really doing there? You know, it's like I, I hear you're going for another round soon. What are we? What are we doing over there? And so, like, it's not even like something anyone necessarily thinks about. It's not like a VC person knows like what it takes to make a programming language. They just see the column and they say, "Oh, we'll move the column over." There. Um, <laughs> no, they're smart. They're smart. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah. So the question becomes like, is doing a good job on the language deeply related to their purposes? Um, and like when I was working at Prezi as a concrete example, um, they had this situation where their application was written in Flash and Flash was going away. So they were saying, okay, it looks like we have to rewrite to JavaScript, uh, Android, iOS, and desktop. So it's not just that we're rewriting our whole product, but we're rewriting it four times at the same time. And so they said, let's hire this kid and see if like this programming language can help reduce the costs of like 
essentially 4xing what we have to do to, um, to continue. And, you know, I was young, we didn't know, we didn't know how long it took to make a programming language. Turns out, it's, it's more than like a year. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, at some point it was like, okay, it's clear that this other path is gonna work. And so, that was over. And it's not like, oh, I have hard feelings, like I only have gratitude that they supported my work and believed in me that I could help with that. Um, but it didn't work out. Um, and it wasn't like I did a bad job, but in my head, I said, okay, the only thing I really can do here is just work hard. Like, make the value of my output undeniable. No one can look at it and say, well, he actually isn't even good at it, you know? They have to look at him and say some other thing. You have to, they have to look at the columns. They have to look at something else. And what was difficult is that this doesn't really work. Like, ultimately, your efforts and achievements aren't directly connected to your ability to pay the bills. It's just like something else is happening. Um, and I, I didn't know that going into... Um, going into these relationships, and had I known that, probably 2015, 2016, I would have tried to, you know, you know, I'm not gonna, if you want to patronize this, then great, but I'm also gonna try to develop the consulting path, and I'm not personally, like, the guy for that, but I should have, I wish I had known, like, oh, try to find a business partner who can do these kinds of things, and you're bringing something valuable, like you're bringing uh, reputation, and you're gonna drive incoming leads, but like maybe you don't answer emails that good or like uh, <laughs> on time or and if people find it really annoying. And it's like, okay, but okay, but we, 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 we're, we're partners, right? Um, so the other one, so this is kind of like, we're just pretending that these exist um, and just thinking about them. Um, so with donations, people donate because of their own personal reasons. Um, and it's really hard to know those. I mean, even the person donating might just have a feeling like, oh, I want to do that. And if you ask them, well, why do you want to do that? They'd be like, oh, I am, I don't know. Like, well, <laughs> and I mean, also, why, why ask? Just say, good. Uh, <laughs> um, but on the hosting side, people are using the service because it suits their needs and preferences. Like, they have a task they want to do, and this is helping them do it, and that's valuable to them. And in each case, you're going to get different samples of the people using your language. Um, and so in the donations case, it's not a representative sample. So like with Python, I would imagine that most people who use Python don't know who Guido Van Rossum is. Um, and let alone of the people who do, would they know that there's a way to do donations and of them. So you're getting this very particular sample size, or sample. Um, and with hosting, you get more of a full range of people using the language. Um, and so in, with, in both these cases, you're gonna have some questions in the back of your mind when you're trying to make decisions. And so like on this side you have like, are the donators gonna approve of this? And the donators are gonna have all kinds of opinions of like, okay, I, I like where you're going, but I think it should go faster and it should cost less. And, um, or actually we should be going in a slightly different direction. And that's, you know, that's just a natural thing. Cause like even within a company, it's hard to um, get everyone to agree uh, to a direction to go. And, and in this case, there's, the relationship's inverted. Um, and so on the other side, it's like, will it be easier to make websites? And it's like kind of a measurable thing. Like you, you do the thing that you believe will work, and then the results are it works or it doesn't work, and it's on your technical results, not what people think the technical results will be if they are completed at a future date. Um, and so I had this feeling that this would be a much healthier work environment, and there'd be more time for the technical work you could make more long-term investments. Um, and again, the thing I didn't realize is that it's not just Jeff who can Jeff you, but anybody can Jeff you. Um, and so, okay, so that, that ends the portion of the talk where I know about things and then sharing experiences. But, so I had this idea, it seems like hosting would be cool, and well, Jeff can't Jeff me, and these other people, I, I'm not thinking about them right now. Um, and I was like, I have this idea. I'm just gonna sit here and I'm gonna think about it, because I think I can compile Elm to C and SQL, <laughs> and have it run on Postgres, and I can support custom types in the table, so in the columns I can have my maybes and results and anything you can think of, and I can have a dense binary format for that, and I can use it over the wire so there's no encoding and decoding, and the same way that I check the types uh, when you do pu package publication, I can do that on tables and detect, oh, we need to do a migration here, um, I was like, I think it's there. 
And the crazy thing is that it's there. I, I, I have it on my computer. It's like, it, it's, like I, it's not like done done, but it's like I can do my little demo and everything. Um, and then I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Anyway, I, I, I remember I needed to think about the Jeff problem more. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to get Jeffed. I'm going to get Jeffed by everybody. <laughs> and so it's just, it's just on my computer. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, and that's the economics of programming languages. I just don't know what to do. <laughs> so, So I have some closing things uh, to, to ask of people or to think about. And so one, to authors of these kinds of projects, um, I just want to say the open source way is for businesses. Um, you can't come into it just like wanting to do a good job. You have to figure out these other kinds of things. You have to think about all these options and how they'll interact with what you want to do for your language. And then to people in this room and everyone else, I just hope that we'll try to tell young people it's not what you read online, it's not what people say in forums. It's like, there's all this other stuff going on and I don't think we should let that happen to young people. Um, um, uh, to users, um, I, I think this system for me helps me look at languages in a better way. So I'm able to ask, what are the goals of this specific language? Um, maybe they're trying to have the biggest user base possible, maybe they're trying to explore ideas, maybe they have some particular thing they're interested in. Um, and what's the situation of the author? Is it a big corporation, a little company, a person? Is there a venture capitalist standing over their shoulder, standing over their shoulder? And, you know, because the way someone's going to design a language is going to be different if there's someone being like, you know, you could probably tighten the screws a little bit over there um, where the money is. Um, um, and then try to evaluate the trade-offs if they suit your needs, right? Like, not all these languages are going to produce the same thing. And so if you want to have the DevRel out there, like, you're probably going to want to go with a corporate language. It's no, no problem. It's just that's what you'd want to do. And if you want some more niche experience, um, you're going to want to go with an independent language, but you're not going to get all the same things. Um, and so, yeah, and also, like, there's your needs, and then there's also your preferences, which is like, okay, I have, I know what I need, and what I prefer is kind of like a separate thing. Um, and so, yeah, so when I, when I look at languages, I can look at them, or I like to look at them and say, okay, what was their specific goal? Okay, I don't necessarily share that goal, but that's what it was. And then how did they solve that with language design? And it's always something inspiring, and you can always look at a language and find something inspiration and cool about it, even if, for me, it's like, well, I, I don't need to do that. I don't, that's not how I want to do things, but... I can still find inspiration and be glad that I saw that and it's out there. Um, so I wanted to leave with two final questions. What did you think of that uh, internet landlord idea? Like what even would be the implications of that? Um, if there's this thing collecting rent off of all of us, is like, is that, is that, is that bad? I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I just literally don't know. Um, and then is there a way to address the switching costs that has a clear pathway for small authors? Again, I don't know, um, but you know, if you do know, uh, I'm Evan CZ, and you can just tell me on Twitter or Elm Slack or, or Gmail. Um, and if you're using Elm, I can show you a little demo. It's on my computer. Um, but yeah, I, I, just, I don't know what to do. And that's the economics of programming, which is thank you. <laughs>